Common understanding of the real presence of Christ, Article 154. Lutherans and Catholics can together affirm the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper. In the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, is present wholly and entirely in his body and blood under the signs of bread and wine. Can you believe that a Lutheran put his pen to that and signed it? My dear brethren, my dear Lutheran friends, are you going to walk over this precipice and give up your Protestant heritage? The common, this common statement affirms all the essential elements of faith in the Eucharistic presence of Jesus Christ without adopting the conceptual terminology of transubstantiation. So what did they do? We don't like the word transubstanti transubstantiation. We won't use it anymore. That's fine. But what happens is exactly the same, so who cares? That's what they've done. It's brilliant. It's evil. This is evil. That's spoken like a serpent. To the question of the real presence of Jesus Christ in its theological understanding is joined the question of the duration of the presence. Now you must understand what they're talking about. Because in Catholicism you may venerate the host. You may venerate it. You can pick it up, this monstrance with the host in it, and then you can worship it. That is idolatry of the highest order. It is an abomination before God. Now let's read what Lutherans are willing to sign. All right, so the duration. He stays the body and blood according to Catholicism and therefore he's the real body and you can venerate it. And with the question of the adoration of Christ present in the sacrament, that means you can venerate it, you can adore it, you can pray to it. Differences related to the duration of the Eucharistic pres presence appear in the liturgical practice. Catholic and Lutheran Christians together confess that the Eucharistic presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is directed towards the believing reception. That it nevertheless is not confined only to the moment of reception. So in other words, it was body and now it's no longer body. You understand what I'm saying? And that it does not depend on the faith of the receiver, how closely related to this might be. Okay, so how long does it stay, the literal body of Christ? And they're saying, it's okay? Are they moving towards venerating the host? This is impossible. This is impossible. With regard to the issue that was the greatest importance for the reformers, the Eucharistic sacrifice. You see, Catholicism teaches that the Eucharistic elevation is exactly the same sacrifice as happened on the cross. That means Christ is perpetually sacrificed on a daily basis. It's not biblical. The Catholic-Lutheran dialogue stated as a basic principle, Catholics and Lutheran Christians together recognize that in the Lord's Supper, that Jesus Christ is present as the crucified who died for our sins and who rose again for our justification. Could you ever have imagined that a Lutheran Protestant organization could put pen to paper and sign something like this, yes or no? This is unbelievable. Unbelievable. My question, how far will you bend, Lutherans? How far will you bend? Let's just study Martin Luther. Because the very basis for duping the Lutherans into accepting something like this is what Martin Luther supposedly wrote, right? And said. So let's study what it's all about. So let's go to uh, a normal Christian source not from my church. What are transubstantiation and what are consubstantiation? Martin Luther changed his view later to consubstantiation because he had a growth in Christian experience, but consubstantiation was also still wrong. And did he later change to the full Protestant view? Yes or no? That is the question. So let's look it up. What is the difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation? 
The word transubstantiation derives from the Latin trans, across, and substantia, substance. The term is employed in Roman Catholic theology to denote the idea that during the ceremony of the Mass, the bread and wine are changed in substance into the flesh and blood of Christ, even though the elements appear to remain the same. This doctrine has no basis in Scripture. There are traces of the dogma in some of the post-apostolic writings and in the concept was vigorously defended in the early 9th century AD. It was adopted at the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, formalized by the Council of Trent, and was reaffirmed at the Second Vatican Council. Rome never changes. Just a fact. Okay, what did Martin Luther believe initially? Consubstantiation is a term commonly applied to the Lutheran concept of the communion supper, though some modern Lutheran theologians reject the use of the term because of its ambiguity. So modern theologians should all reject it, not just some. But nevertheless, this is what they say. The expression, however, is generally associated with Luther. The idea is that in the communion, the body and blood of Christ and the bread and wine coexist in union with each other. Luther illustrated it by the analogy of the iron put into the fire, where both fire and iron are united in a red-hot iron, and yet each continues unchanged. So really not much difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation. And the Protestant world argued with Luther, Zwingli argued with Luther on the issue. And uh, most of the Protestants wouldn't accept it, and his own theologians argued with him and didn't accept it. Martin Luther was, he was, he was clinging to some of the aspects of the Catholic theology. But, ha, ah, what a relief. Table talk, Martin Luther. What a magnificent book. And I've referred to it many, many times. This book has such a phenomenal history Every single Protestant on the planet should read this book. This is the book where his friends and his colleagues wrote down what Martin Luther had to say around the table when he was not constrained by formal circumstances. So what came out of his mouth is what he actually felt and believed. Beautiful. The book was banned on pain of death. Anybody who had the book was sentenced to death by Rome. They dragged the people out, murdered them, slaughtered them if they had the book. Eventually they said, if you bring the book and we burn them, then we, they will be free from the sentence. So the books all disappeared. It had been translated even into High Dutch. And there the book was gone. And then centuries later, someone was building a house and they dug up the foundations. And in the foundations, wrapped in wax and sealed in wax, they found a Dutch copy of this book. And even then, they were so afraid of the authorities, they smuggled it out to, to England. And there was a gentleman there who was working at the king's court. And he knew both languages, and he was to translate it. And uh, he never got round to it. And one night, he had a dream. You can read it in the cover of the book. One night he had a dream, and he dreamt that an old man with a white beard said to him, you must translate that book. And he said, yes, oh, he got such a fright, he was going to do it, but forgot about it again and didn't do it. A week later he was arrested. Nobody gave any charges. He was thrown in jail because the, in his dream the man said to him, I will give you time to translate it. And there he languished in jail, I forget the exact years, but could be seven years. And he translated the book, and eventually, through circumstances, it uh, ended up with the archbishop, and eventually ended up in the English parliament. And we spoke about the English parliament yesterday, which was extremely pro Protestant. And as a consequence of reading this book, the English parliament didn't really want to be involved, or the Protestants, didn't want to translate everything that Luther said because of what he had said about consubstantiation. But listen to what it says in this book. This is now what the 
Parliament decided, whereupon they made report, dated the 10th of November, 1646, that they found it to be an excellent divine work worthy of the light and publishing, especially in regard that Luther, in the said discourses, did revoke his opinion, which he formerly held touching consubstantiation in the sacrament. Whereupon the House of Commons, on the 24th of February, 1646, did give order for the printing thereof. So the reason why they permitted the reprinting of this marvelous book was because Martin Luther had given up consubstantiation. Is this anywhere in this modern report of the Roman Catholic Lutheran dialogue? No, they deny it, because it's deceptive. So I want to make sure, Martin Luther, what exactly did you write? This is Martin Luther speaking. Even so, we must let the words of Christ remain and speak of the sacrament in suis terminus in their terms, with such words as Christ used and spake. Do this must not be turned into offer this. So the sacrifice is gone. What signifies it to dispute and wrangle about the abominable idolatry of elevating the sacrament on high to show it to the people. What did Martin Luther call that? An abominable idolatry. What does the joint document say? You can do it. Because it's really the body and the blood. So let's not argue about how long it is there, but it's venerable. Hello? And they're saying that Martin Luther believed this. Yes, he believed it in the beginning. He didn't believe it in the end. So this is deception of the highest order, which has no approbation of the fathers, and was introduced only to confirm the errors touching the worship thereof, as though bread and wine lost their substance and retained only the form, smell, and taste. This the papists call transubstantiation, and darkened the right use of the sacrament. Whereas even in Popedom, at Milan, from Ambrose's time to the present day, they never held or observed in the Mass either canon or elevation of the Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord be with you. So, Martin Luther denied everything that's in that document that they claim he believed. Case closed. So, this is an abominable idolatry. Why is it an abominable idolatry? Because every Roman Catholic church is not a church. It's a temple and a cathedral. And a cathedral is a burial place for the dead, where sacrifice is made for the dead and to the dead. And that's why in every Roman Catholic altar there must be a relic of a dead bone, otherwise they cannot tell a mass. It's an an abomination. You shall not consult with the dead, nor will you sacrifice to the dead. It's an abomination to God. This is a typical Roman Catholic altar. Look how it is made out of hewn marble. You go up the stairs. Exodus chapter 20, verse 26, Neither shalt thou go up the steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. No steps were to go up to an altar. All Roman Catholic altars have steps. Deuteronomy, thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. It had to be whole, unhewn stones. Why? Because they represent the character of Christ, and the character of Christ cannot be hewn and squared because it's perfect. But the bricks that went into the temple, they had to be hewn and squared because they represent you and me, the people, who are hewn and squared in the quarry of this life and then built into the temple by representing living stones. So this is an altar as it was. Here is one of hewn stones. According to God, this one is an abomination because it does not reflect the righteousness of Christ. Isaiah 65, verse 3, A people that provoke me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifices in gardens and burn incense upon altars of brick. You're not allowed to build them like that. Catholicism violates every principle of the Bible. It is not 
a Christian religion. Martin Luther said this elevation of the host, as you see the Pope doing here, is an abomination. It's an abomination. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve.